bringing it to your attention and so you can start to get some background with it. And I think that's one of my goals here today is to kind of give you an introduction to where it is actually starting to make a difference in our industry. They swore this would work. This is wireless stuff, I tell you, there's got to be an easier way to make a living, huh? Okay, can someone advance the slide for me? There is a wireless at its best. Oop, there we go. I don't know if I did that or some magic happened there. Um, you know, before I got started, though, I got to take a moment and kind of, you know, reflect back on where all this got started. Um, for me, I started my career in the 80s. Um, back in the 80s, that's when the whole concept of spread spectrum, shared spectrum came about. Now, this was long before the days of Wi-Fi. Um, but this is really the foundation of Wi-Fi and all our mobility solutions. Uh, and the reason that AI is relevant to this, if you look what's happening in our wireless industry, um, the regulations are slowly changing, right? As we as a society become more mobile, right? As we put more and more of this internet traffic on these wireless networks, uh, we need to make better use of the spectrum that's available to us. And you look with the spectrum policies that have been around, license spectrum is where we started, right? That's been the policy of most governments is basically to sell spectrum, uh, you know, to Comcast, T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon guys. But when you look at what these mobile operators really have, they only typically have 200 or so megahertz of spectrum to play with. Uh, and most of that cellular spectrum was designed for voice, where they weren't really optimizing for carrying data. It's really in the 80s that they really got around to the concept, is there a better way of using spectrum? And this is where we got to the shared, unlicensed spectrum, right? And for those who remember back then, uh, it was really around direct sequence versus frequency hopping. You know, before Wi-Fi, it was all debates about what technology were we going to use to share the spectrum. Uh, and back in my days, back in you know, the 80s, see how many people out here, anybody still remember Metricom Ricochet? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So we got another old guy in the crowd. Um, yeah, so back then it was really, we were looking at, you know, can we build these unlicensed mesh networks to hook all these laptops up that just had these new browsers on them? Um, I would tell you the one thing I learned on that adventure, it was, seemed like a good thought, mobile internet. Uh, it's all about market timing. It was a much better thought when Apple came out with the iPhone. Uh, but the 80s was really around the shared spectrum region. What we're seeing in spectrum, and this is where AI comes into play, is you know, we're still looking at how can we use spectrum more efficiently. Uh, and this is where CBRS and shared spectrum is starting to come in. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see much more intelligence coming about about how we access spectrum, right? Back in the 80s with direct sequence, it's more about trying to find the right technology to share it. Uh, we're going to get much more intelligent about actually sharing that spectrum. Now, is, let me take it. Is there anyone here playing with CBRS, private LTE? Do I have any private LTE shared spectrum people out here? No federal, no federated wireless guys here yet. Uh, but this is another place where we're going to start to see more intelligence and in AI making a difference at the foundation level of what we do for a living. And when you kind of look at where this is taking us over 20 years, um, you know, when you look at the Cisco VNI data, right? You know, it's hard to believe in 20 years we've gone from zero to now Wi-Fi is carrying almost over 50 to 60 percent of all internet traffic is going over some Wi-Fi net network, right? It's become the workhorse of our video traffic. Right? You know, for you or in the SP or mobile operator, right? You know, almost all that traffic right now is Netflix, YouTube, video. Um, we still need cellular for the outdoor world, but we need spectrum to basically carry all this video internet data traffic that we want to. Or, and when you look at the when you look at the value, you know, we've gone from zero in the last 20 years to really where Wi-Fi is now a multi-trillion dollar industry that's driving everything. And so that was kind of the 80s and the 90s. Um, for me, you know, my next adventure was really back in the early 2000s when Wi-Fi was just getting off the ground. And that adventure started with a company called Airspace. And there was really a paradigm of trying to help enterprise IT guys basically start to take care of these Wi-Fi networks. That's when all the controller architectures came in place. 
Uh, that was the second big disruption in the Wi-Fi world, right? We went from that autonomous AP world to, hey, we're going to build something that looks like a service provider network. We're going to be able to control it to start managing all these access points. Um, for me personally, after the aerospace adventure, uh, Cisco acquired that company. I became the mobility CTO uh, at Cisco, and then I started to see other transitions happening while I was at Cisco. Uh, and one of those transitions was the case where Wi-Fi went from this nice to have, you know, it was a really hard thing to sell back then, to kind of a must have, right? We slowly started to become a, you know, became power, light, water. We didn't really have to argue with someone about buying Wi-Fi uh, in the mid 2000s. That's when we got to the next phase of the industry. Um, the other thing that happened there is while I was there, I was kind of responsible for innovations and investments. And one of the companies we acquired was Meraki. Uh, and this was a cloud-based company, right? Uh, and Meraki was really that transition to cloud is inherently a better way to maintain and distribute software. And that was probably the next architectural transition that happened in our wireless industry. Uh, but what became clear to me in that phase was I started talking to some very big customers. Um, in addition to going from a must-have, more and more companies were starting to put critical services on these wireless networks. You know, it's one thing to have an upset employee on your wireless network. You know, you can almost tolerate that, right? You know, they can gripe and yell, but it's not, you know, you're not going to get too excited. It's another thing when you have a very upset customer on your wireless network or you're trying to put a robot on your wireless network and it's starting to affect your business, right? The robot goes down for a minute, it's a million dollar a minute cost. Uh, you put a mobile app on your wireless network, you better make sure that wireless networks. Uh, and this is really where it started to become obvious to me, we are basically with AI and ML, we are gonna start to see a paradigm shift. You know, back in my airspace days, it was really about Mr. Customer, here's a box, here's some management software, good luck. You know, give me a call if you have a problem. You know, here's my support, here's my support line. Uh, what we're seeing or what I'm seeing with AI and ML, the paradigm shift is we're gonna move to more about, you're gonna be responsible for t the actual end user experience, the end-to-end -end experience from uh, this device to the internet, right? It is not gonna make a difference whether it's a Cisco box, a Aruba box, or a Juniper box between this and the internet, you're gonna be responsible to, to try to explain why is this guy having a bad experience. Um, and for most of you in this wireless world, you kind of know the network always gets blamed, right? Whenever the user calls up, you know, they don't, they don't really care. All they know is that this is not working uh, and it's your problem to figure out why it's not working. And so this is why I think, you know, for most of the, this is where I've seen this AI ML stuff is gonna seriously make a difference. I would say the other reason I actually started MIST was this Watson, let's see, how many of you guys remember the Watson Jeopardy adventure, right? Now that was kind of amazing. You know, when I saw that, it's like, hey, if they can build something that can play championship level Jeopardy, you know, we should be able to build something that can play wireless Jeopardy, right? This is just one category, right? The only thing I have to get good at is answering questions about why is this wireless user having a problem? You know, and that was kind of a data point for me that this AI ML stuff is actually becoming real. And it's going from marketing hype to something that's becoming practical and something we can actually use uh, for our day jobs. The other critical milestone for me on this AI ML journey was really around um, indoor location. Uh, and I'll connect the dots for you here. Indoor location has been one of those things I've been working on ever since my airspace days. Um, it kind of reminds me of the early days of Wi-Fi. You know, when we started Wi-Fi, it was hard to sell and everything. It was really when Intel put Wi-Fi into the Citrino, we got Wi-Fi into our laptops. That was kind of the catalyst that drove Wi-Fi connectivity from a nice to have to a must have in the enterprise. Uh, in an indoor location, if you look at the friction points that's really stopped this from happening, uh, there's been several. One is this compelling apps. We don't have indoor location by itself is not a reason for an app. You need to have a compelling app to hang on it. 
that is starting to happen across our verticals, you know, retail, healthcare. Uh, we all have our airline mobile apps, right? Everyone here has a air, couple airline mobile apps on their phone. Um, how many people? Well, oh, here, how many people here now have their grocery store app on their phone? Right? It's becoming pretty cool now that you can basically order your food and pick it up at the grocery store. Right? That is becoming a must-have reason to have the app on your phone. The other reason we've not seen indoor location is really around this technology. You know, Google, Apple, they have not agreed upon a technology. BLE is probably the first time we have a common technology that Apple, Google, Samsung all agree as kind of a location technology. And for those who keep track of this stuff, I don't know how many of you saw the latest announcement from Apple, right? Apple just announced support for ultra wideband. Uh, an ultra wideband is a step up from BLE in terms of location technology and actually finding things. You know, so we're finally starting to see our mobile device vendors actually agree upon something. And probably the third thing, uh, which ties to AI and ML, is usually indoor location requires a lot of complex setting up. You know, you have to basically set it up. You have to do a lot of uh, troubleshooting. You have to do a lot of this wayfinding. Um, configuration stuff on it. Uh, this is something that back in my airspace days, I could not solve on a 1U Linux box. Uh, in today's world, I've been able to basically create these little ML algorithms, unsupervised training, that can learn that path loss model, right? That model that relates RSSI versus distance. Uh, that's usually what you have to go around and walk and collect data to get that data point. You have to basically walk around uh, and get RSSI data with location to figure out what that path loss looks like. With these new ML algorithms and with enough compute at Amazon, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and this is another data point when I started to realize that this ML stuff is starting to get real enough. Um, Amazon is another key part of this, right? The cloud, the cloud guys have now given us enough CPU and storage. You know, I don't have to even think about how much CPU is going to take or how much storage is going to take. I do have to think about my Amazon bill. I do get this Amazon bill that's kind of scary every month. It reminds me how much CPU storage. But the point is I don't have to really, I'm not limited by it. As long as I have money, I can buy as much compute storage as I need to solve a problem. So this is a case where ML, personally for me, actually made a difference. Something I've been thinking about for 15 years. And after 15 years, I actually had the opportunity to actually use ML to actually make a difference. You know, for the skeptics, um, you know, I would say if you look at Google, this graph here kind of gives you why did this AI stuff actually start off, you know, back in the 2014-13 time frame. Uh, this graph here shows you when people started actually Googling and searching for AI in ML terms. Uh, and for me, when I look back and where I've been through, I think there are a couple things that happened back then. You know, back in... I think it was the 90s or so, I did my master's. I actually did a neural, net, neural network thing from our master thesis. Um, the problem 20 years ago was could not build anything that was big enough that would really solve real world problems. You know, so back in the 2013 time frame, we started to get enough open source TensorFlow, enough compute storage, where people are now building neural networks that are relatively, relatively large. Right? We have enough compute power that we can actually build neural networks that do interesting things. And all that happened back in the 2014 time frame. Uh, and so this is one reason why this AI stuff you're starting to see actually start to impact different parts of our industry and different parts of our society. Um, the other thing for the skeptics is this is my, my head of data science. Uh, this is his way of trying to tell the difference between AI and marketing AI. You know, so his rule of thumb, hey, if it's uh, in Python, it's probably real. If someone can show you some Python code, it's probably some real machine learning. Uh, if it's PowerPoint, be very suspicious. You're probably dealing with some marketing AI. But for me, when people say AI, it means you're trying to do something on par with some human behavior, right? You know, whether it's driving a car or trying to diagnose a cancer, you know, your doctor trying to get some help on that. Um, in our industry, you know, my mission for the last four years is actually to build something that can do something on par with a network domain expert, right? The vision is to try to build something like Wireless Jeopardy 
that can help a networking IT person solve problems and answer questions and automate their operations of their networks. Um, and so this is my version of AI, is when you're trying to do something that is on par with a human behavior of some sort. You know, for me, I've been on the journey. I started MIST. Um, Jeopardy was an inspiration, one of the inspirations for MIST. Uh, when you read the story, if you ever read the story behind the Jeopardy story, um, it was a five to six year journey for them to actually play something that could beat a championship level Jeopardy player. Uh, I've been on this journey for about four years. Um, for anybody else who wants to start the journey, uh, the recipe for building your own AI solution is first raise about $90 million. Uh, hire a bunch of data science, hire a bunch of domain experts, uh, hire a bunch of wireless experts. Uh, and the point of this is, this is not an easy journey. It's not something you do overnight. You know, it starts with the data. Uh, you've got to get the data correct. Uh, you got to get the right data from the AP. Um, and that is not as straightforward, and that's one reason when I started MIS, I actually built an access point, because I want to make sure I could get access to the data I needed to solve the problem. Uh, the second big step is actually what I call domain expertise. You've got to get that data into a framework that you can actually apply data science to. Uh, and that is not as easy as you think it is. That's where you may have PhD data science guys who understand all the models, uh, but they really don't understand the problem. And this is where things take time, because you then you get into what they call feature engineering, right? You have to spend time to try to understand which features are really relevant and which model is actually going to help you solve a problem. And then the third key part is the actual data science toolbox. Uh, this is where, you know, trying to figure out where is neural networks and deep learning going to make a difference in our industry, right? Uh, a lot of this stuff has been around for years. Uh, the key point is where can we really use these neural networks to make a difference in the wireless industry? And then the third and fourth is actually putting an interface on top of this that it actually helps your life be easier, right? You know, right now you spend most of your time searching through dashboards, right? That was kind of what we vendors did. We gave you a bunch of dashboards and a bunch of data. Uh, and it was really up to you to search through and try to figure things out. And this is where we're trying to make life easier with this AI assistance is putting on some sort of natural language uh, or some sort of action framework that lets the AI actually take action instead of having humans get involved. Probably the point of this slide is to really look under, you know, if you look at the Jeopardy story, uh, what they found out in Jeopardy was 10% of all Jeopardy questions can be answered with a Google. Um, and the point is when you want to try to answer 90% of all the questions that a support team gets, it will take multiple algorithms and multiple things going on under the hood of that virtual assistant. Uh, this is kind of an example of what I've seen in the last four years of making this work. Um, if you look at the frameworks we've built, you know, we built a framework called SLE metric framework. Uh, these are metrics that a wireless person would understand, you know, roaming, throughput, coverage, capacity type of metrics. Um, I didn't build that framework really for an IT person to look at. It turns out that it is a useful framework for an IT person because it gets the data into a format um, aggregated that they can understand. But that framework was really put there in place so we could apply something called mutual information. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, there's another framework that's put in place, which is really just an event timeline framework, kind of a common sense thing, take all my events. Uh, this is really around temporal correlation, right? You know, so this is the framework that starts to answer the questions of a user has a problem. Um, it turns out that user's problem is related to the router configuration change of someone who basically decided they're going to change the MTU size to not pass large MTUs, right? Um, this is a personal one because this is one I dealt with for two days. A personal customer actually did this, told us the wireless, you know, the wireless demo was broken, didn't work. We started to dig into it, and he's like, sure enough, after about a day of digging into it, we found out that, yes, they swore up and down that no one had touched the configuration, but sure enough, someone had touched the router configuration. Uh, so this is an example where when you want to deal with the wireless problems you deal with, you need multiple algorithms under your AI umbrella. It's not one single algorithm that's doing this magical thing. Uh, and to get to 
an actual action, right? If you actually want to get to something um, that you trust, that you know, you're, I think most of you guys, you barely trust your partner buddy to touch the knobs on your network, right? You know, so who is gonna let some sort of piece of software start twiddling the knobs on their network? Uh, you have to gain the trust of this, whether it's a real person or some sort of AI software to touch those knobs. So this is where you have to get that root cause down to a point where you have enough granularity and enough confidence that you are gonna let the machine to start to make corrections. Um, and I would tell you, we're starting to see some beginnings of self, just like the self-driving car. How many of you guys have self-driving cars now? <laughs> how many of you guys, let, how many of you guys take your others? You guys take your hands off the wheel and kind of say, well, let's see what happens here. And, you know, and you come up to the stop sign and go, hey, does, does this car recognize stop signs or not? I forgot to read that part of the manual. Um, I think that's where we are with self-driving networks. We start, we're having a few customers right now who are starting to let uh, the software basically do simple things like hardware, right? It's like, hey, if we find bad hardware, uh, yes, we know with enough confidence that it's, you don't need to have a human involved. We will find the bad hardware and we will basically issue the RMA ticket. Um, what you should expect, right? I mean, as a vendor, if we ship you bad hardware or bad software, we should know it. We should not expect our customers to figure out bad hardware, bad software bugs, because um, where's my bug guy, you know? That's probably one of the biggest problems, right? Vendor sends you software bugs, you spend most of your time trying to find vendor software bugs. Uh, and that's the type of stuff that, yes, we should start taking care of that. You know, I think the other one we've started to see is bad cables, you know, AP disconnected. Uh, we've gotten to a point now where with about 90% accuracy, we can figure out whether that's actually a bad ethernet cable or if that's a bad AP that's connected causing the problem. So these are the beginnings of the self-driving network stuff is starting to come to life. There's a little, deep, you know, you'll see a little signs of it. Um, another data point why this should be relevant to you as wireless engineers and wireless network engineers, you know, you're dealing with more and more complexity. Uh, you're dealing with more critical services, right? Your business is putting critical services on top of these wireless networks, uh, and they get very grumpy when they go down, right? Especially the distribution center guys who are trying to run their robots on this wireless network. You know, that robots that's running, they're gonna be very upset very quick. Um, this is the, probably what I call my, most times people look at the slide and they go, what are you talking about? Um, you know, I would say, I would hope within a couple years that this will start to make sense to this group. You know, I would hope that uh, CWMP will start offering the beginnings of intro machine learning and AI so you can start to understand what each one of these algorithms are doing. Um, this is an example of where these algorithms make a difference. Uh, up in the upper right-hand corner is where we have new algorithms that are starting to actually be the catalyst for this AI transition right now, right? When we get up to the reinforcement and the deep learning, that is where we're starting to see a real difference of enabling new things that we haven't seen happen before. Uh, anomaly detection is a good example. This is one, you know, we've always talked about it. The trouble with anomaly detection is getting it to a point where it does not create more noise, decibel damage, right? You don't want to wake up in the morning and have a thousand anomalies reported um, and expect you to go through a thousand anomalies. I would tell you, I've worked on this one for probably the last three years. We went through three different algorithms. Uh, this is a case where deep neural networking is making a difference in our industry. Uh, we were able to go with uh, this LSTM model. It's the long short-term memory model. This is a recursive neural network. Uh, it's kind of a tutorial. When you see all that computer vision stuff, that image stuff, that's what they call concurrent neural networking. That's usually what, uh, what they call CNN. Those are usually all the CNN networks. When we deal with R, and these are recursive neural networks, and so they have memory and state in them. And so they're very good at doing text, speech, uh, time series type of things where you're trying to look for anomalies. Uh, what we found with LSTM is we were finally able to get to like 99% accuracy. Uh, so with one customer, we basically had 140 different pre-connection anomalies reported across their distribution centers. Uh, it turned out all 140 were actually real. 
They were actually actionable. You know, so this is an example where this machine learning stuff is going to make a difference to you, me, and our networking, uh, our networking friends. This is probably an older technology. Uh, this is something called mutual information. Um, this is actually something that's been around, uh, but it's really a great data mining technique. Um, this is where like those SLE metric frameworks, right? So for every user, and that's probably the other big paradigm shift from my airspace days to my MIST days. You know, 15, 20 years ago, it was all about trying to manage the access point. Right, we collect a lot of data. Uh, this time around, it's all about the end user. Now that's more data, right? There's 10 times more data. For every access point, there's five to 10 times users who so are basically collecting data on every user on the network. Uh, and what you're doing here is you're basically creating metrics for that user, right? Coverage, capacity, roaming, connection metrics. Um, when one of those metrics fails, and you kind of treat that metric as a random variable, right? So now I have a one random variable, which is either going to be true or false, pass or fail. Um, the other random variable I have is network features, like what AP is that user connected to, what device type, what OS type. There may be 50 different network features associated with that user. Uh, what mutual information lets you do is it lets you basically answer the question of which one of those network features is most likely the predictor of the failure or success of this other variable, right? And so this is the beginning of scope analysis, right? You have a problem. I want to narrow it down to is, it, is that problem related to just you? Is a problem related to an access point? Uh, or is a problem related to the device OS that, hey, it turns out that all my Windows users are having this problem, but none of my iOS users. Uh, so this is the power of data mining. Uh, it also highlights that it takes more than one metric, right? This piece of the solution actually just answers one question, right? It answers the scope question. You know, so this helps to answer about 30% of all the support tickets we get in uh, at our customer success team. The other thing that's happening in our industry is, you know, as I mentioned uh, with Meraki, is cloud, right? When you build these AI solutions, they've got to be built on top of a modern cloud stack, right? Because we're going from a real-time, um, we're going from kind of a static to a real-time. You know, so when I did the, you know, the Meraki acquisition, the thing, they did a very good job of getting data into a database for configuration. Uh, but when you do AI, you really need a backend that can process data real time, right? You know, it's not about taking data and sticking it into a configuration database uh, for making that simple. Here, we're actually taking data into Kafka buses. Think Twitter, right? This is like Twitter, right? You're processing messages coming in continuously in real time to solve a problem. And when you look at our customer success team in the cloud, right? The other benefit of the cloud is you now have complete visibility. This is like Amazon, right? Amazon knows all your buying behavior because it's all there, right? Every time you buy something on Amazon, they have complete visibility on what you're doing. Uh, with the cloud, you have that same thing on the wireless side. You have complete visibility across the whole population of APs out there. Uh, and this kind of reflects what we're seeing on the cloud side in uh, I would say my standard joke for my VP of product marketing is there's really only three problems we deal with in Wi-Fi right now. You know, I can't connect, the Wi-Fi sucks, or why did the AP reboot? That seems to be the top 80% of all support tickets fall into one of these three buckets right now. And your mission is to basically try to answer these support tickets. And this is highlighting the par this paradigm shift on both the architecture and the organization. Right? You know, the other reason I started MIST is usually when there's an architectural transition in an industry, it's easier to do that with a blank sheet of paper outside of a big company. Um, and that's what I'm seeing with AI, because AI requires you to basically build a very good modern cloud stack upon which you can basically get data from all the different networking elements. And when you look at the AI ops, this piece that goes on top, um, that piece is have to start consuming data from a lot of different sources, right? Depending on what question you're trying to answer. 
right? If I'm trying to answer the question of why are Zoom users having a problem, why is video collaboration having a problem, uh, you're going to want to get data from both your wireless network and your SD-WAN network, right? And this is the, uh, probably another trend in the industry. I don't know if I'll live long enough to see this one. I know I see Mike from Google here. This is like, you know, open config, you know, trying to get the industry to all agree upon standards that let us solve, you know, configuration issues. Uh, this is around, you know, can we get the industry to start to agree upon telemetry? Right? If you're going to put something on top of this network, you'll want to start getting telemetry from all these different devices to start to speak the same language, right? I want to get the same data from my SD -in you know, my SD WAN vendor, my wireless vendor. I want to start to be able to get some common data to answer different types of questions. So the point of this slide is architecture. You know, when you look at uh, this transition from into an AI ML world. Uh, the second point is organizationally. Uh, if you try to do this, do, do this yourself, you will find that you'll have to get your data science team directly connected to your customer success team. Uh, and this is what I think the industry found when we did uh, DevOps in the cloud, right? To build very scalable, large uh, cloud applications, you know, you found that your operations team and your dev team had to work hand in hand get those cloud apps to work. Uh, so this is very similar to that paradigm of, yes, we need to get, if you want to do AI, you have to get your data science team and your customer success team to work tightly, hand in hand, uh, into solving problems, into solving a particular problem or trying to answer a particular question. This highlights the, uh, for about the last year, I've been trying to use uh, Marvis AI uh, for every support ticket that comes into MIST, right? You know, the question is, where are we in terms of playing championship-level wireless jeopardy? Um, and, you know, another thing, if you guys ever have, you know, want to have some fun, go, go YouTube Watson Jeopardy and see the early days of, you know, how well Watson, it's kind of humorous to see Watson trying to answer questions in some of the early days of Jeopardy and some of the answers they came up with. Um, so for the last year, I've been having the support team use AI ML to answer every support ticket coming out. What you see here is it took about a year. If you look at the top line, that orange line, um, that reflects, did I have the data in the cloud, right? If I'm going to answer a question, first of all, I've got to have the data, right? If, if the data is stuck in a switch, an AP, or a router, then I have no chance of answering that question. Um, so it took me about a year just to get the data I needed to answer most of the questions we saw coming in from our customers, right? These are all the support tickets coming in from customers. Um, the blue and red line kind of reflect the, how often did Watson, or how often did uh, my version of Watson Marvis get the right answer? Uh, and right now we're about halfway. About half the time this AI ML engine helped the support guy either get the answer or get to the data quicker. Uh, so that gives you a feel for where are we are, where, where I am on the journey. It also gives you kind of a feel for, yes, this is becoming real. You know, we're actually using some sort of AI ML to actually help IT, wireless IT guys manage and operate their networks. Um, probably the other thing I've learned you know, for all the new wireless guy, most problems can be solved if you live long enough and are you're persistent. Um, you know, so after doing this for 30 years, uh, I think uh, who was our hotspot 2.0 guy? You know, that I that was back in my Cisco days. You know, I do think I'm gonna live long enough and <laughs> to see hotspot 2.0 finally be adopted in the industry. Um, I think the other thing we're seeing happen in our industry is we're starting to see the convergence of our Wi-Fi and cellular worlds come together, right? You know, and I think that is driven by spectrum, right? If you look what's happening in our Wi-Fi world, you know, we, we are basically built upon the concept of unlicensed and shared spectrum uh, and open. Uh, if you look at the cellular world, it's kind of built on a very controlled, deterministic uh, we want to deliver a very deterministic voice service. 
Uh, if you look what's happening at Wi-Fi 6 and 5G, at the physical layer, these two things are looking very similar. Right? Wi-Fi 6 is getting much more scheduled, you know, OFDMA. Uh, and you look at the cellular world, I think with the physical layer, we're starting to actually match up. Uh, I think it's really going to come down to spectrum, you know, what is the best way of using the spectrum? You know, is it better to use it as a licensed band or is it better to use it as some sort of shared band? And I think what we're seeing is the regulators are starting to figure out that these unlicensed bands are a much more efficient use of our spectrum, right? If you look what's happening in the six gig band, right? Uh, we're about to get another gigahertz of spectrum uh, added to the unlicensed pile. And when you look at the AI piece, I think this is the other piece that's going to be uh, the next probably five, ten years. This is another, if I live long enough, uh, I do think we will start to see AI and ML start to actually make a difference in our industry. Um, and so with that, I want to thank everyone. Um, I'll take any questions or see, or see if at the end of this, have I converted anyone? Any, any of you uh, skeptics converted to, the, to more believers yet? Hopefully I didn't lose anyone. Up there, there should be at least one question there. Let's see if we can maybe get the back of the house to transition that question up there. You know what? Just in case I wrote it down. Oh, the screen's flickering. Maybe. Ah. Maybe. But this is working. This is good. There we go. All right. So, um, so the question that was submitted uh, in regards to uh, AI and machine learning scalability. How scalable is the solution? Can you manage manage thousands of APs with it? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Yes, we're ma managing uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of APs. Um, this is uh, not so much AI as the, the modern cloud stack now, right? Uh, there is really truly no limit to how many, a how many things you can manage on a distributed microservices architecture. Uh, and that's probably the other big paradigm shift that uh, people don't fully appreciate is back in the airspace, my airspace days, right? That was an embedded software architecture. Um, and what we did with the cloud, right? We didn't simply take that controller code and like, let's put it in a Docker container and stick it on the cloud, right? When you get to these cloud architectures, you truly do move to a microservices API distributed architecture. Uh, and those architecture, when you look at these, these teams that uh, deploy cloud solutions, you know, Google, Amazon, Twitter, uh, those solutions are truly, you know, I don't know if there's any limit, you're limited by the size of the data center. You're limited by the size of your Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft data centers nowadays. Probably have time for one more question. Any other questions? Yeah. Where would you recommend someone start to learn about ML and AI? Um, as it would apply to Wi-Fi networking? Uh, so my recommendation now is I've, I've tried to look for good books. There is a book called, I think, The 100-Page Machine Learning Book. Um, that's not a bad book to just kind of get the basics of the different models out there and kind of start getting a feel for it. Um, I would say, you know, when you start to move to the cloud, there's two components to this, right? There's kind of the API. You know, I mean, first you gotta become a Python programmer. See, I, I assume everyone here is making the transition to APIs, Python programming. That's the other big piece. Uh, but yeah, that would probably be the first book. There's a nice book called 100 Page Machine Learning there that kind of introduces the models. Uh, the typical thing, the next thing most people try to do is Coursera, right? You know, once you kind of wrap your head around the basic models, the next thing is try to get a try and take a Coursera course and see if you can't actually build a neural network or train a model. Um, I will tell you that anyone in this room could be a data scientist by Monday. Um, everybody in this room can basically, I did it myself, so I know you can do it. In three days, you can basically go to the web, find an example of a uh, neural network, and download everything you need to do is to train a neural network, right? They have all the data sets up on the network you can basically build a neural network to recognize numbers or something. Uh, you could have that homework assignment done, what's today, Wednesday? Yeah, you could have that done by the weekend if you wanted to. 
and the point of that exercise is you'll find out that that is the easiest part of the job. Is yes, training the model can be done very quickly. Cool. I think that's it. Let's give it up for Bob.